flow again, we're going to address spasmodic croup here. Um, everything uh, that we talked about in the croup section, you'll want to know. Uh, spasmodic croup is not a whole lot different in presentation, uh, but it is worth knowing about because there are some uh, minor differences. Okay, so uh, this is uh, sort of a list of these upper airway diseases that we're talking about. Spasmodic croup can be caused by any of several viruses, sharing in common a lot of the viruses that are causative of traditional viral croup. Uh, however, there are allergic causes that can be behind uh, croup, uh, spasmodic croup as well. And then uh, there's also uh, reflux disease can cause a spasmodic croup. So this is just the airway here. Um, so you get the mouth and then uh, your uh, laryngopharynx, the epiglottis, um, and then uh, your larynx, the, the vocal cords here. Uh, the subglottis and the trachea are going to be the areas that are most affected in croup and spasmodic croup. Uh, I will preface that spasmodic croup does not have quite the same degree of inflammation that we see in uh, viral croup. So spasmodic croup is part of the differential diagnosis of croup. It shares similarities, but key differences from, uh, I put true croup here, but just say viral croup. Uh, it does include viruses, but also includes allergens, and in some cases can be psychogenic. Uh, clinically, it's inconsequential. Uh, this typically doesn't, even viral croup is not really a serious disease in the vast majority of cases, and spasmodic croup almost always is not a, um, a serious problem. Uh, but it does cause symptoms and concern, uh, dif discomfort for the patient and concern for the parents. Uh, so clinically, it's pretty inconsequential. The treatment is going to be reassurance and symptom-based. However, when you do treat this as you go about uh, diagnosing this, it may be difficult to distinguish from croup. Uh, you may go ahead and get an x-ray thinking that this is viral croup, looking for your steeple sign and uh, you find out that there is no st steeple sign, as there generally isn't in spasmodic croup. Uh, only about 50% of patients with viral croup will actually have the steeple sign. So the absence of a steeple sign does not mean that the patient doesn't have viral croup, and so getting an x-ray, not having the steeple sign, does not necessarily mean it's spasmodic croup. So the x-ray, if you do have steeple sign, it points you towards viral croup. If you do not, you still can't really distinguish that this is spasmodic or viral croup. Uh, so what you really have to go on then is uh, more of the history and uh, the timing and then uh, when making a retrospective diagnosis, especially in the, uh, when, when you're asking patient's history, uh, you want to know how often have they had these symptoms, have they been in the hospital before in the ER uh, for similar problems. So. Um, so let's talk about that. So the cause, we already talked about uh, spasmodic croup uh, encompasses all the causes of croup, also including aller uh, allergic, uh, GERD, and psychogenic causes. The symptoms are pretty similar. Uh, they'll probably be a little bit more severe in croup uh, as opposed to spasmodic croup, but they include that barking, seal-like cough, hoarseness, uh, possibly inspiratory stridor, uh, which may follow uh, an upper respiratory tract infection, uh, or maybe during a upper respiratory tract infection. One of the uh, one of the useful physical exam findings that you may notice uh, is a, a low grade fever, and that almost always points towards viral croup uh, as opposed to spasmodic croup. But not all patients with viral croup are going to have a fever. Uh, but if they do have a fever, then it's pointing towards viral croup. The timing in general is just worse at night uh, for patients, and that goes for both croup and spasmodic croup. Uh, like I said, with fever, uh, you may see a low-grade fever in croup, but with spasmodic croup, uh, there, there is none. Uh, on diagnosis, uh, for croup, you can diagnose this either clinically, uh, as in most cases, or you can get a chest x-ray, uh, which in about half of cases will show that classic steeple sign. Uh, with spasmodic croup, it's more of a diagnosis of exclusion. If the patient doesn't have a fever, but has uh, croup signs, uh, then uh, you might lean more towards spasmodic croup. Uh, what's important here, and I, I can't believe I didn't put it on here, but uh, what, what's important and what really points you towards spasmodic croup more than anything is a repeated history, recurrent quote-unquote croup. Uh, so this is a patient that maybe is in two or three times a year uh, for croup, or at least if you ask the, the parent, the, the child has had these episodes of barking cough and hoarseness, and they go away pretty quickly. That is very typical of spasmodic croup, where it's more recurrent 
and it doesn't last quite as long. Whereas croup tends to last about a week, spasmodic croup may only last a couple of days at the most. Another thing that can help you out is, let's say you're not sure if this is croup or spasmodic croup, you want to just go ahead and try treatment. Typically viral croup, because there is more inflammation, it tends to respond to racemic epinephrine and uh, oral steroids. Uh, whereas spasmodic croup in many cases does not respond to epinephrine and steroids, so that can help you too. Complications, uh, virtually none for spasmodic croup. With croup, in a small minority of cases, uh, you can get hypoxia uh, if, uh, if the inflammation is uh, significant enough. Only a minority of patients, usually, uh, I think I read in the literature about uh, 2 to 8% of patients uh, with croup are going to need hospitalization. Uh, so, not common uh, for this to cause really significant problems. Okay, we already talked about that. Okay, this is the Wesley score for croup severity. So, this goes for viral croup, and uh, I suppose you could apply it towards, uh, towards spasmodic croup. Um, just in general, when you're looking at the patient, uh, of course, this is subjective, a lot of these things. Don't memorize this. You can take it or leave it. Uh, but uh, if you have a patient with croup, it might be useful to use this scale to determine sort of where they're at. If they might be one of those minority of cases where you might want to hospitalize them. For the most part, this is common sense. If there's impending respiratory failure, usually that's pretty clear. Uh, where the gray area might be, where you might want to hospitalize them, is if it's in this severe uh, range. So. There are five, uh, five parameters, so we're looking at retractions, which can be none, mild, moderate, or severe. You can see the number of points we assign. Uh, the degree of strider, cyanosis, uh, consciousness level, and air entry. So you can see, uh, quite obviously, if a patient is having uh, cyanosis, any kind of cyanosis, and is disoriented, that puts them at a nine. Generally, we are going to hospitalize those patients anyway. That's, again, common sense. Um, you can see uh, if there's retractions, that's going to add up your points too. So uh, for the most part, it's common sense, but you can use this, uh, this score as sort of evidence-based medicine uh, as to whether or not you want to admit the patient. But uh, like I said, it's generally common sense as to how much respiratory distress the patient is in. Usually you can rely on your intuition as to whether or not you want the patient admitted to the hospital. Most of the time in croup you won't have to do that and virtually never in spasmodic croup.